Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Riders Drinking Whiskey, the show where even Charles Bukowski would say, you might want to slow down. I'm your host, William R. Hensey, and joining me today, and I'm going to nail this the first time, unlike every other show, is author, poet, Ray McManus. Ray, welcome to the Whiskey Bar. Thanks, Bill, man. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, awesome. And I did nail it that time. See, I took you a breath. It, I slowed it. <laughs> <laughs> my old drama teacher would be so happy she's like she's always like just slow down enunciate the little i'm like i can't be too excited excited to have you here like you have a ton of um I, I did look at your bio i know you have a ton of like credits and things but i always like to let the author um come on and maybe just tell us a little bit about yourself your writing journey kind of leading up to today okay um the writing journey is a bit wild um, and certainly unorthodox. Um, I was born and raised uh, in South Carolina, uh, in rural South Carolina, as a matter of fact. Um, uh, in fact, I still live not even 15 minutes from where I grew up. Um, like you know, a lot of Southerners, you know, we, we tend to not stray too far. Um, but uh, I did not grow up with, with poetry in my house. You know, my mom didn't read poems to me when I was a kid. And I thought, you know, at the ripe old age of eight years old, I want to be a poet when I grow up. Um, you know, I was like your typical um, uh, stoner kid in, in high school, uh, you know, uh, grew up working class. So really the only thing I knew was that I was going to have to work. Um, and so by the time, you know, you, you can carry things, you know, that's kind of what you're groomed to do is, is, is to work. And um, it wasn't until probably my junior year in high school um, and was in uh, I was in the boys room um, using it for its intended purposes, although most of my friends would go in there to smoke. Um, but I thought that was kind of stupid to do that in the bathroom, in the building um, and right next to that was uh, this teacher by the name of Miss Bickley. And Miss Bickley was this short kind of just badass woman that would just walk into the bathroom if she smelled smoke, which she did. Um, and I'm standing at the urinal and she asked me, you know, uh, uh, Mr. McManus, because they all mispronounced my name down here. Uh, what, what do you have in your hand? And, you know, and I was maybe a little angry, maybe a little embarrassed. Um, uh, so I answered with a very limited vocabulary and that got me in trouble. Um, and so I got into uh, uh, in school suspension and which was not uncommon for, for me and a lot of my friends. We, we spent a lot of time in in school suspension and um, we had to read books and write like one page synopses of, of what we read. And most of the books were very pedestrian, you know, Jacques Cousteau or, you know, the history of John Deere. I mean, it's a very rural high school. Um, but for whatever reason, um, on that day, there was a book in the pile uh, called Sound and Sense, A Poet's Perspective, um, Purine's book, you know, and um, I started thumbing through it and I fell in love with the language. Um, you know, and these were all poets that I probably should have at least read maybe one or two of them at that point. But I, like I said, I was just kind of stupid and um, and and didn't. And. Um, and, and, and innocently, I fell in love with the language because it wasn't like I fell in love with it. Like, oh, my God, this is incredible poetry. I thought more along the lines of, you know, hey, these would make great songs because um, me and my friends, we were going to put together a band. Um, you know, we had everything figured out except how to play musical instruments. None of us knew how to play an instrument. Um, so the band never made it. Um, but when it was time for us to leave and turn in our, our sheets, um, I was scared that the book would go back on the shelf and I'd never find it again. So, so I stole it. Um, and what I ended up doing was, you know, I wouldn't say religiously, but, but I would go through the book a lot all through the last couple of years of high school. Um, and got to the point where towards the end of, of high school, I thought maybe I should go to college because I, I didn't think that cutting trees was going to have a retirement plan or, you know, small engine repair had some longevity to it. You know, I took those classes because I thought I'd work on Harley Davidson's. Uh, instead, I was working on weed eaters and lawnmowers. And uh, so I dared myself to go to college. Um, and I took that book kind of with me along the way and just kept dabbling uh, little small little vignettes and little tiny things here or there and love poems that I'd try to impress a girl with or something like that. And um, you know, and it's always that one English professor, right, that that just kind of uh, catches 
a, a glimpse or a glimmer that, you know, hey, this kid might have some promise. Um, that didn't quite happen that way. It was more of a professor that asked me to stay after class and told me not to come to class stoned anymore. Um, said, you know, look, you're wasting my time, your time, uh, money, you know, you, you're too smart for that, you know. So, um, so, so I listened to her and, and quit coming to class stoned and asked her if she'd be my advisor. Um, and of course she took me on and, and, and which was great. Um, and towards my senior year of college, she said, you know, and I'd kind of started showing her a few things that I'd been writing and, and they were very, you know, uh, abstract. They weren't anything that, you know, would, would blow anybody away. And certainly things that would be embarrassing for me to look at now, you know, but she said, you know, you really need to take um, this poetry workshop. And I didn't even know you could take a class in college where you could write poetry. And that class lit a fire under my ass. Um, there's just no two ways about it. Um, Ed Madden, <clears throat> who taught the class, and he's a he's a poet here. He's from Arkansas originally and, and has lived in South Carolina, I think, since 94. And, um, you know, he really took a shine and, and, and said, you know, man, you really ought to stay and do your MFA. And I'm like, what the hell is an MFA? You know? Um, and, you know, and he's like, you, you could do an MFA in poetry. I'm like, you can get a master's degree writing poetry. Like, okay. You know, that sounds great. And at the same time I'm working, you know, I'm working full time while I'm in school and Bilo, which was sort of a national chain at the time, a grocery store um, had, was grooming me right on up to middle management, you know, and I was making, you know, pretty decent money. Um, and I went there for an interview um, for a store manager position, and I was going to get it because I was good with the regional vice president and stuff. That day after the interview of the interview, I came home, went to my mailbox, and there was my acceptance letter for the master's program at USC. And, I, you know, I, I, it was weird to turn down what I thought was going to be like the most amazing money I was ever going to make. You know, I think probably like fifty thousand dollars or something, you know, but to 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 be a grad student and live off of like nine thousand a year or something, you know. But, um, you know, I I something pulled me to it. And once I got into that program, um, you know, I got to still work with Ed, which was great. Um James Dickey had died by that point, um, so I never really worked with him. Uh, but it was good because we brought in Kwame Dawes, and I got to work with with Kwame. And Kwame and Ed were kind of like my two dads, you know, um, you know. And so they both really helped me to not just um, fine tune what I was trying to do with with poetry and kind of tap into this sort of raw um you know anger and 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 angst that i had of growing up in a, in a very uh conservative area very um like i said very working class rural area that um and i'm just writing about experiences i'm having you know or had and um so they helped me hone that craft and they also helped me to understand the 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 beauty and benefit of community um and so um really that was the start of it um, and, you know, during that process, we, uh, um, I created a program called Split Pea Soup, going out into high schools and working with kids in their, you know, in their language arts classrooms um, and giving them an opportunity to write poems, um, you know, and I would come up with these wild prompts and, you know, very tight, you know, sort of time frames, you know, and get them to write things and I'd share poems with them and, uh, all under the idea that, you know, maybe, you know, things would have turned out a little different for me had I had opportunities. Because um, really where I grew up, there just weren't opportunities. Um, and in Columbia, our capital city here, there, there was more opportunities, but not really in terms of writing poetry. Um, and so uh, getting them into doing that um, really helped me to learn a lot more about what I'm doing. Um, and so... Um, you know, that old cliche that teachers tell students, you know, I'll learn just as much from you as you will from me um, actually was true in that particular aspect. Um, uh, and so did that for, gosh, about at least uh, almost two decades, um, you know, working with the schools and stuff. And uh, since then decided, you know, I didn't want to pay back student loans yet. So stay and get my Ph.D. and 
um, focused, you know, just making things a little more marketable so I could get a job in, 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 in a university. And uh, lucky enough that uh, I landed out at uh, our Sumter campus within USC, where I could work with first generation college students like myself and, and, and get some poetry going in a place that, that might not otherwise have it. And, um, uh, and so, yeah, um, just a, a, a punk ass kid doing stupid stuff. And I, like most things, I fell into it backwards and, um, and, and it saved my life. Now we'll say that 25 years later, I did go back to my old high school and I gave him back the book and I just I wrote a nice little, you know, inscription in there that just said, you know, I stole this book. Um, can't remember the date, um, but I stole this book and stealing this book saved my life. Um, and I gave it to I didn't I didn't give her any any context. I just handed it to the librarian and she opened it up and read it and just started crying. And and uh, and then the next thing I know, they've got that book and a couple of my other books on display, you know, like, look, there's one of our own, you know, um, which was weird because I would have burned that school down, um, you know, 10 years before. So. <laughs> but it's one of those things like who's to say you're the conquering hero, you're the uh, returning, you know, the villain, like who, who's, who knows, like it all depends yeah. on the perspective and the moment. So um, that's awesome. So I know you're in South Carolina. Most importantly to me, where, oh, and actually, I think it might be worth saying, because I'm in LA. So when you say USC, I keep thinking University know, of Southern yeah. California. You're yeah. you're talking University of South Carolina. Yep. The Sumter yep. campus is the, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the easy way to remember it is that we were a university before you guys were a state. So that's, <laughs> <laughs> um, that's okay. I'm not a grad or anything. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. I know. I know. But you're right. So so what we did um, uh, God, a couple of years back, they tried to rebrand it as um, U of SC. And it just doesn't <laughs> roll off the tongue. Like, hey, off the why tongue, do we though. have to do that? So, so yeah, yeah, we're talking about the University of South Carolina, not the University of Southern Cal. Uh, okay. Fine school, mind you, fine school, but uh, yeah, clearly <laughs> sure. opposite ends of the country. So. <laughs> right, right, opposite coast there. Yeah. Um, so, where are you at in South Carolina? So, I live in uh, Lexington, which is just outside of Columbia. Um, and Sumter okay. is sort of on the other side of Columbia. Um, and so, Columbia is nestled right in the middle of the state, um, right in the Midlands of it, um, which is really the best of both worlds because we have the low country. Uh, with Charleston, South Carolina is very historic and, um, um, you know, a lot of tourists love to come to, to, to there, you know, of course they love to come to all of the, the East coast. Um, uh, you know, we have, um, you know, beaches over on one side and foothills to the great smoky mountains on the other and, you know, kind of being nestled in the middle, um, you know, the bad side of it is we get no breeze um, and it's hot as hell in the summer. But the good side is you're about an hour and 45 minutes from really going to any of those places. And so, you know, it really um, uh, gives you a lot of, of various landscapes and, and, and people. Um, you know, uh, I think there's there are times when, you know, certainly from folks looking in probably think, you know, all Southerners are the same or all South Carolinians are the same, but really it's, it's, it's very regional. Um, upstate has a little bit of a different culture and vibe than the low country and the Midlands has, you know, a little bit of both. Um, it's a little different on the Eastern side of the state than it is on the Western side of the state. Um, sure. but, um, it's, it's, uh, it's an odd triangular shaped state. So if you're in the middle, you really can get to just about anything. Uh, uh-huh. so. Sure. Yeah, very good. Well, I think it's like that everywhere, right? Everyone thinks LA and they literally yeah. think like this like two mile little radius like in Hollywood and everyone's right. everyone's <laughs> like that. And I was like, Yeah, that's not that's not the you know, the majority. The forty million people living here are don't all have Botox, you know. So sorry to ruin it for everyone. <laughs> and we're not all beautiful, unfortunately. Like some of us look like this, you know, this is what happens. But uh and most importantly though, I I forgot to ask that where is the one place to get a drink? If we're in the uh, uh, Columbia area. So so we've, you know, right now it, it's kind of wild. We're in a transitional period. We've got a lot of these really cool microbreweries coming in 
um, and are, you know, establishing a place to, to, to drink as well as, you know, what they're producing their product. Um, but my favorite place right here in Colombia is this place called Wico, um, which is very much an outdoor type of beer garden, um, which, you know, with the exception of about two to three months in the summer, um, climate here is, is pretty nice. I mean, you know, we're in November, it's 70 degrees outside. I mean, you know, it's a decent breeze blowing now between, you know, you know, J June, July, and August, you know, yeah, you're, you're scrambling for air conditioning, you know, last thing you want to do is sit outside <laughs> sure. and drink. Um, yeah. you know, but, um, uh, th those are the kinds of places I think that, that, that kind of draw me in because there's a, there's a culture there. There's something, you know, there's, sure. there are people there that, that will, you know, the way that the beer garden set up, you know, these long tables. And so you could be sitting there talking to your friends and there's a complete stranger sitting on the other side of the table and you end up talking to them. And the next thing you know, everybody at the table, especially after a few drinks, we're all best friends, um, all right, all right. You know, which is better than the sports bars and, and, and all, all of those right. sorts of things. Um, and then, of course, you know, we have uh, uh, we, we have a really great um, right here in Lexington, a really great Irish pub called O'Hara's. And uh, and that's really taken off. Um, and so mm -hmm. uh, it's it's kind of cool to um, to get in there and watch, you know, um, you know, country folk uh, experience Guinness for the first time. And, you know, <laughs> and I feel like, feel like I cut my teeth on Guinness, you know, being Irish and everything. But um, uh -huh. uh, but, you know those there there are lots of little places like that um and 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 that makes it um uh you know worthwhile to go to cuz you can actually you can actually have conversation while you drink and, sure. and um and like i said because the weather's so nice you can be outdoors while you're doing it um and so right. yeah I well know. and you mentioned the word earlier too community i think like yeah. a lot of those places have taken off and i think it's we keep losing more and more communal places and thinking yes. we're replacing them virtually and yes. it's not it's not a replacement it's a it's a horror and if it is it's a horrible <laughs> horrible horrible right. replacement. <laughs> yeah i mean maybe, this is maybe fun. it is but <laughs> right <laughs> right but um awesome so that that leads to the most important question of the show which is what are we drinking so um it's funny you should mention so i um my my typical I I've been drinking more bourbon um, I'd say probably since COVID I was pretty much a beer drinker throughout you know um, COVID hit and I was like I didn't want to go out to the store every time to get to get beer or anything like that and and plus I had I'd had a palate for bourbon um, down here you know you kind of grew up that way I mean you get mm -hmm. palate for bourbon and moonshine it's kind of like, just not together <laughs> at the same time that's, that's, all right that's, right. That's a recipe for disaster. Um, and so, you know, my bourbon of choice that I usually go to, especially when I'm just socially drinking and just, you know, chilling out, um, is like four roses. Um, okay. So I went out to 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 the liquor cabinet. My son, he's 23 years old. Um, and I think he must have come up here on a couple of days while I was at work because I go and I'm like, the bottle's empty. It couldn't have evaporated. So, um, so luckily at work, somebody had gifted me um, um, a bottle of Knob Creek. Um, and okay. that before. So it's a, um, it's a, a small batch um, Knob Creek. And, and, um, mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's good. It's quite tasty. 100 proof. Um, so, you know, you got to be careful with it, I guess. But, um, you know. <laughs> or not. You know, or not. You're on the show called right. Writer Drinking Whiskey. Here we are, you know. I mean, that's that's the one thing about doing a show like this is like, yeah, I can drink as much as I want. I don't have to drive anywhere. So. <laughs> exactly. And it's like, that part of the virtual works out very well. It you know, does work is... out pretty well, yeah. <laughs> awesome. But I've, I've you know, always I'm, been... I'm, I've always been one. I never really liked the 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 sweet things, you know, and and so, right. um, but uh, but I do prefer bourbons that have, um, uh, they're they they're not they're not as sharp, um, you know, the ones where you know the alcohols like just it's really just burning your mouth and and um, sure. So so there's and there's a few of them out there that'll do it, um, no doubt. Oh yeah, um, but. Right. But yeah, Bullet is a good one. Um, I do enjoy that one. Um, but yeah, typically, like a small batch, Four Roses is 
kind of the go-to because you, I mean, it's just like, I don't know, it's from heaven or something, but. <laughs> I like my bullets to actually have uh, what I've been sipping on while we've been talking is an old fashioned. I had my, my bullet rye. Um, yeah. I usually have a big bottle of bullet rye and a big bottle of uh, bullet bourbon. Um, the bullet, the bourbon, I think my 23 year old son or, or since I don't have one myself may have finished that bottle and it's empty somewhere, but, um, but I still, I still got that one. But what I was going to drink for today, cause I like to have, um, a bottle with a story here, um, is I had, um, what is this called? It's the, so this is made in Mammoth Lakes, California, which is an old caldera of a super volcano along the Sierra mountains. Um, it's huge, huge. It's in the Northern, well, it's really in the middle portion of the state north of me but along the sierra mountains probably two hours ish from san francisco and it's um called if i can see it there this is the um the shelter distillers wild rose is the name of it and i got this when my uh my niece and her husband um then fiance were getting married um during COVID. i think this was literally 2020 um, and they still wanted to go through with the wedding. And so they needed somewhere outside. And then there's still tons of restrictions. There was always tons of restrictions in California generally. And so there's, right. it's, it's really high. And so they wanted to get married and it ended up, they could only have like 15 people there. Um, mm-hmm. And so it was going to literally be like their parents and stuff and siblings essentially. Right. Yeah. And, uh, but because I was always super close with my niece growing up, Uncle Bill, will you be our officiant? So her and Kevin, you know, my niece Tori, Kevin, well, oh, you'd be the officiant. So I'm like, awesome. I wanted to do it. I love, I have a kilt. I like to, I like to wear out like when I can. No one yeah. likes me to wear it, but I think I have the legs for it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm like, oh, give me the kilt. I'm like, they ended up nixing the kilt, but I, I did the wedding. It was, very, it was a very lovely time there. But then they, as we were there for the week, I kept, we ended up keep meeting up with, um, and we're very close with Kevin now, now to her husband. Um, and they have two kids now, but we kept meeting up with his parents and there's right next to this, um, to the distillery, um, where they were, they also had like a little bar where you could drink outside. It's kind of the same thing. They'd be outside. So we, and it's, and Mammoth is a huge place geographically, but the businesses are a tiny little place, like kind of right. right nestled in the mountains there. So we, uh, drank tons of this, uh, tons of this with them. So I'm going to just be, uh, just be sipping on that while we, uh, while we chat. And it's been, a uh, man, that was, I mean, 2020. So we're three plus years later. So this, this yeah. bottle is overdue for being, for being drank. Yeah. So Absolutely. we'll see if we can put a dinner into it. Well, today. I'm honored to, to share that space. So. <laughs> Very good. So cheers, my friend. Cheers. Slanja. That's good. And I think this one, I think they call it wild rose, if I remember right, is that there's some wild roses along there that they use in the brew. Because actually, as I tasted that, I was like, where, where did that floral come from? And I think that's that's part of the name. So I guess I should nice. have imagined that. So, so getting getting now past uh, you and where you are to, to moving into your work. A bit here. So I, I did read your bio and there was a couple really interesting tidbits where I was hoping we could we could dig into here. Um, one of which was there was a description that described your work as teetering in the space between the narrative of hope and the heroics of failure, which uh, for one, I, I love it. It's a really lovely phrase. My work has been described as teetering between like schizophrenic episodes and mild coherence, um, which, you know, fair. You know, thanks for the constructive criticism, mom, you know, but <laughs> I thought it was a really fascinating, fascinating way to describe it. What, um, going back to your phrase and not my, my mom's, um, maybe too harsh criticism of my work, of my work. Could you explain what that, what that phrase means to you and, and to your uh, poetry? Yeah. I mean, I think, um, you know, was it Dickinson that said, you know, tell the truth, but tell it slant. Um, and, you know, I, I get it. I get what she's, you know, w- what she's referring to. But for me, um, 
I think the, the, the truth has its own beauty to it. Um, and, you know, I was always, I, I always felt like, you know, when I would be reading, especially very early poetry, you know, very heroic, you know, and, and these great men, they marched on and they, you know, despite all, you know, I'm like, that's bullshit. You know, nobody thinks like that. You know? <laughs> right, we question right. everything. And, and the moments that we think we, in our heads, that we can do these great things, we ultimately fail. And I think as, as um, you know, as as a as a country, as a society, whatever we want to call it, um, you know, we, we've we've placed this 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 horrible um, um, bad taste in our mouths about failure, um, and and I think that's what we learn the most about ourselves. Um, we learn the most about the world around us. Um, you know, does it suck to fail? Yeah, absolutely, it sucks to fail. Of course, we want to succeed in everything. But I don't learn anything from the moments I succeed. I, in fact, I think yeah. I do most like most humans and think, you know, eh, I did it. I succeeded. <laughs> um, when right. I fail at something, um, you know, I begin to look, OK, why did I fail? What did I do wrong? What can I do better? How can I make this a success next time? Um, and that's the kind of growth that I think I'm, I'm, I'm more interested in, because otherwise, what a sad and depressing world we live in. Um, you know, there's, you know, what we achieve something and then that's it. It stops and there's nothing else. I mean, um, because if that's if that's where we are, if that's what we subscribe to, then um, we're going to reach a moment where we, we don't need to do anything else. We don't need to learn anything else. Um, right. So and, and I grew up in an area where I saw so much failure. Um, and, and I mean, I don't mean like, you know, um, somebody took a right when they should have taken a left. And that is, of course, sometimes how it happens. But I'm talking spectacular, outlandish <laughs> failure. I mean, you know, sure. um, and just everyday people, you know, um, doing extraordinarily, you know, failures. I mean, like, like, like <laughs> literally you, 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 you question, like, how in the hell did you do this? You know, it's like driving down the road and you find the car, you know, in the opposite direction of traffic upside down up against the telephone. Like how in the, f did that even happen? Um, you know, and, and right. so unpacking that and unwinding that is, is always been something that I think is, is worthwhile. Um, mm -hmm. you know, when you, and when you grow up in the South, um, you have a whole history of failure. Um, and, you know, right. and, and there are, um, you know, historically have always been people who've tried to mask that, sugar that and say, you know, oh, we didn't fail. We weren't, we weren't, we didn't start a civil war about slavery. We were fighting against Yankee aggression. Um, like, <laughs> no, you were fighting right. the war for slavery, man. Um, you own it. You, you fucked up. Okay. You know, right. just own sure. it. Um, and, you know, and so, so seeing that and, and growing up with that, um, I think has really informed a lot of how I look at the world, you know, and, 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 and not with judgment, um, you know, it's not sure. about, you know, looking at, um, how we screw things up, but, but, but actually taking part in it and owning the fact that, that, you know, we all screw up, we're all fallible, um, and, right. uh, uh, and, and, and not to make excuses for it, but it's okay. Um, and you can learn from it. Um, sure. and so a well, lot it's, of it's not only okay, but it's inevitable to some it's degree. Inevitable, right? right. <laughs> it's going to happen. I mean, you know, so, so why not go ahead and embrace it, <laughs> you know, be okay. Right. Um, right. And, and then learn from it. Right. I mean, it's, right. Only, right. it's only terrible if you continue to do it over and over again, like, you know, what you're doing is wrong. And yeah. you just keep doing it and you just keep failing. <laughs> right. You know? so, right. That's when you're a monster. Right. 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 <laughs> yeah. So yeah. so you know that that to me was was from you know very early on. Um and and still to this day, I think a very important part of what I'm trying to do when I'm I'm writing about you know what I'm given um is you know sure. it's it's not all pretty. Um but you know, even in the ugliest moments, there is something beautiful that can come from that. Um, right. there is something that is redeemable. Um, right. and, and if we don't think that way, then man, what a bleak existence we live. I mean, so. 
Amen. Amen. I think about that a lot because I, I, you know, and I've had people on the, on the show before who said that they don't like to think of it as failure, which, which fair enough. I mean, it's, you know, you I start yeah. arguing. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's a very healthy way to look at it. Um, but I've looked at it. I've tried to really look at it like, okay, maybe I failed. Maybe someone I love failed, but we all really have that opportunity to redeem that failure. Right? Maybe that failure is within ourselves. Maybe it's just something, it's just a behavior. Maybe it's just something we've done, but we do have that ultimate chance of redemption Yeah. and you just have to take it. So if you, if you're not, if you're keep not, keep not, keep not, yeah, you'll hit the end of the road where you're on the wrong side of the freeway <laughs> upside down against this. Right. <laughs> yeah, the hell Until I get you here? get there. <laughs> Until you get there, you got a chance, you know, and maybe right. if you survived that, you might still have a chance. Like there's, right, you know, right. all, well, think, all kinds of really beautiful stories. Well, I think too, we, we, we focus so much on the product of things, right? So we only right. see the end result. You know, we see, Wow, man, Bezos makes a lot of money. I want to make a lot of money. I'm sure the guy, I mean, you know, you call him what he want. I mean, I'm sure he made a lot of failure along the way. You Absolutely, know, yeah. he kept staying forward. I mean, you know, maybe mm-hmm. he's an outrageous dick. I don't know. But, but the fact <laughs> right, is, sure. you know, there's a process involved in, in everything that we do. And if there's a process in everything we do, then failure, like you said, is inevitable. Um, you're going to make mistakes. Um, learn from them and try not to repeat them. <laughs> you know, so I, I tell <laughs> right, my sure. students, you know, because they'll they'll in there, you know, they they they're going to Google me, you know, they're going to see these things. And they're like, Doctor McManus, I didn't know you did all this stuff. And I'm like, all right, guys, let's just keep it all in perspective here, okay? You know, I can count on one hand five great decisions I've made in my life. Outside of that. There's a whole lot of bad decisions in my life, you know, that that I have uh, learned from, you know, or I'm I'm no smarter than you are. I'm just older. I'm more experienced, which just I I just means I've made more mistakes. Um, right. And I think that that's an important I think that's an important thing for a poet to, to realize. Um, if you go in, if a poet goes in and looks at the world from a top down approach, they've missed the entire premise of writing poetry um and you know coming out of an area uh and, and that really you know didn't never felt privileged um now certainly you know in in the latter years i can look back and see that yes absolutely i was privileged just from the color of my skin and and where i where i live um but growing up i never felt that way um you know and and all the people that I worked with, um, you know, uh, that I looked towards, especially, you know, men, you know, that I looked towards, they failed every day, um, you know, mm-hmm. and, and there were times when maybe I just ignored it because maybe I didn't know any better. Maybe I didn't know how to deal with that. Um, but um, certainly looking back, I can chart it. I can see it. But it's again, it's not with judgment. It's it's more along mm-hmm. the lines of, yeah. I did it too. Um, and then mm-hmm. so if we can acknowledge that and we can recognize that, then maybe we can get to some of the, the 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 heart of what causes us not just to fail, but to overlook failure and to pretend like it didn't exist. Um, yeah. Because I think the more we do that, the more we realize we are much more similar than we are different. Um, right. Right. It's, it's, it, we're, we're human. I mean, and, and mm-hmm. we are destined, we're destined um, to do stupid shit. And, and <laughs> then we're definitely destined to do stupid shit. So right, right. Yeah, it's like we have a whole history of it. You know, I don't know yeah, what we're running away from. It's like, in our DNA. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> and I wonder about that. And maybe that's why, because uh, that that phrase, right, is the space between the narrative of, of hope and the heroics of failure there's no victory in that. And I think maybe like in the, as we've discussed, right. That that sometimes victory is a fallacy anyways. Right. I think it was, um, I think it was Faulkner. I think I just looked at it not too, too long ago where you talked about victory being an illusion. Um, it is. And, uh, and I, I think you can kind of, you get that sense from that. There's there's, you know, there might be momentary victories. I mean, the real victory is just 
being here, right? Just loving people, being just getting lot, the chance man. to <laughs> exactly. And they like that's what you can't forget. Like your victory is being alive. So mm-hmm. that that can be hard yeah. some days. And some <laughs> days at some periods of your life that might be really hard. But if it's not, you yeah. those times it's not, you better also soak that up. Like enjoy that because that is your uh, your victory lap. Well, and then, I mean, you know, and you just talked about it earlier. I mean, 2020 should have been a prime example for us to really reinvest in, in ourselves and realize that. I mean, it literally at that time was a victory if you didn't get COVID. I mean, because mm-hmm. the outcome of getting it meant that sooner or later, you know, you're on a ventilator, you know, and you're not coming back. Um, and, you know, we lost, you know, a million people. Um, you know, and I lost, you know, you know, friends of mine lost, you know, you know, you know, family members, uh, sure. you know, and, and that was to me, you know, one of the things that when I was working on the new book, you know, the new book wasn't really going to ever really get into COVID because it was really looking more towards masculinity, but, you know, we, we write what we're given. I mean, and, right. and at the time I'm here at the house and, and I can't help but think about, Every day, you know, if I go out to the grocery store, you know, I'm taking a calculated risk. I'm going to come back and not only could I catch this, but I could give this to everybody in the house. We could all be dead. And so the next day, if I can take a deep breath and not cough, that's a victory. That's that's Mm -hmm. that's something. But I think what what also happens, too, is we become complacent in that idea. Right. So, oh, I've achieved this thing. You know, I mean, I could have I guess I could have thought that in 2008 when the, or 2007 when the first book came out. Oh, I published a book of poetry. I'm done. I, I'm not <laughs> that way. You know, I'm like, yeah, no, I'm yeah. in the next book and the next book yeah. and the next book. Um, there's there's, you know, the the idea um, of, of being complacent and settling to me is a death sentence. Um, yeah. and, and it's a matter of, you know, constantly moving forward. Right. Yeah, no, that's, that's lovely. I think there's that journey, right? I mean, we, there's, there's been a, a thousand people that have probably said it better than we're going to say it now as we're sharing drinks, but there's the, I don't know, it's, Bill. it's I think about we're saying it pretty well right now. <laughs> it's true. I, I'm just trying to be modest, you know, like, I, I like it. I like it. <laughs> This is internet gold. Also, there was the the part in in your bio where they talked about the um, I think the way it was phrased was the unreal land of Ireland, right? Is yeah. that especially I think this is very pertinent to Americans, um, mm-hmm. especially it's that um, like my my on my dad's side, my grandfather was Irish, um, and my grandmother was um, Italian or was they're both still alive. They're they are Italian and Irish um, and full. And, and my the Italian side was, I think, my grandfather. We're actually trying to narrow it down because apparently I can get citizenship if I can do it. So we're like, we're going to buy a house in Italy. And it's probably <laughs> never going to happen. We're going to fail at the house in Italy, but uh, we're going to try. Um, right. But and so but, I, you know, I've been to Ireland now. I've been to both now, like, but I went as I was 40. Right. I mean, much further as an adult. And it really struck me, though, because besides the extended lands of, 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 of immigrant people, um, mm-hmm. mostly, not, not that everyone here is an immigrant, but the, the huge immigrant people population, right, that 99% of the country is, um, that has come from immigrants. Um, but it was also that I was born in Morgantown, West Virginia. And until this past summer, I would always say that I've never been there. <laughs> Mm-hmm. because I was born there. My dad was going to WVU and he was in the air force. So we ended up moving off. I had no memories I can tell you any, I know that, that the college was there. That's all I could tell you. And so this past summer we went out to visit all my families in West Virginia, Western Pennsylvania. Um, oh, I didn't set my camera up right. There's a Steeler sign over here ish. Um, <laughs> I usually make sure I catch, you know, uh, cause that's our family inheritance is loving the Steelers and seasons like this sometimes you know, scorning the Steelers. Right. Um, but, uh, but so it was an unreal land to me. like the place I was born was this kind of unreal land to me. Um, and I read that it really, really made me think is that there's like, there's oceans inside of us, right? Like we, 
we think that they're continuous and unchanging and we seem continuous and unchanging because we're continuous here. And we think, and it's, it's not until um, there's, there's something that breaks us from that. Right. But there's ecosystems like teeming beneath there's human drama unfolding, you know, on the top there's um, there's tsunamis occasionally. And that's what breaks us. And we see, Oh, something happened. Like this is this amazing thing. Um, and then it goes back to the way it was. And so, and that's all interspersed by these unreal lands, they, they, these fictional places that we create. That's Morgantown, you know, that's Ireland and our memories and things. How do you deal like now, like with, with that sense? Of, is that still like a sense you have of it today? Or is that? Yeah, I mean, not so much now. Um, early on, definitely. I mean, in, in the South, there is, there's not a lot of connection to to one's heritage other than other than the fact that you know if you're an O'Neill or you're a McManus or you're McWaters you know you know that you're Irish uh, you know and in fact what what typically they will do is somebody at some point looked it up in a pedigree and saw that name was also Scottish and so they go around and tell everybody they're Scots Irish and like you know <laughs> it wasn't until I got to college and I started looking in I'm like no we're, we're not Scots Irish my own I had uncles that would tell us you know in fact they would actually say Scotch Irish and I'm like God that, that is not even a real thing um, that's mixing right. two blends together and that's just volatile um, but. Scots Irish, you know, obviously come, you know, out of Ulster and um, for, you know, after the Highland clearances and they moved them into Ulster and then they moved over um, when they the, the English realized that putting the Irish and the Scottish together was not a good idea. Um, you know, they said right, about, sure. you know, and of course, they settled in the Appalachians and, and then they, you know, find their way around and stuff. But, you know. I think once my dad, you know, I think a lot of it kind of stems back to sort of the oral traditions, you know, and talking about, sure. you know, um, uh, you know, immigrant memory is is weird um, because there is, you know, early on, yes, there's talk of the old country. But then once this assimilation starts to take place and you start becoming American, you don't think about the old country anymore and you don't talk about the old country anymore. And so um, sure. for the longest time, you know, and, I'm, and the McManuses have been in South Carolina predating the, so, you know, predating the revolutionary war. I mean, so, wow. you know, they've been here for a long time, um, you know, and yet, and, it, and it's weird because my wife, my wife is also, she really gets into the genealogy. We found out that like typical South Carolinians, we are related uh, at some point uh, by marriage, not by blood. Um, I know <laughs> Carolinians marry their cousins. Um, but, you know, there is, you know, her family, too, was here before the Revolutionary War. But you've got a lot of back and forth going on in my family. Um, and so, you know, brothers would be born here and their sons would go to Ireland and then they would have kids in Ireland and they would come back here. And so there's a lot of this back and forth. It gets real complicated. So I can understand why the story gets sort of muddled. But early on, I think um, for a lot of Southerners struggling to sort of really truly find their identity and find who they are, you know, um, when you when you do learn that um, it's cathartic. I mean, you because you start to sure. you start to understand the cultural ticks and why you do certain things and, and maybe why you like a good bourbon or a good Guinness. You know, <laughs> or, you know, maybe sure. there's some things like sure. that, you know. But but there's other aspects to it that that make more sense. But but early on, there is always this romanticism that takes place, you know, in the imagination. Um, that it becomes an escapism, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, sure. so for me growing up to know that I was Irish was good because I felt like in many ways I wasn't white, you know? Um, you mm -hmm. know, and when you see, you know, in the South, um, that's an important distinction, um, you know, sure. because I didn't see things the way other people around me saw, but I passed because I was white, you know, and so I'd hear them say the things that they say. Um, and, and then probably even in my younger years agreed with it because I didn't know any better, but 
as I got older, it's like, this doesn't sit right, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, because I don't see a whole lot of difference here other than the color of one's skin. You're both trying to work. You're both living paycheck to paycheck. You're both being oppressed by systems that are around you. Why do you think you're better than somebody else simply because you're white and they're not? Um, and which is very Irish to think, you know, um, mm -hmm. but, but like you said, once you go there and you get there and first of all, I mean, going to Ireland for me is like going to a family reunion. I mean, you know, I saw these people <laughs> that look like me, you know, um, you know, but, uh, you know, we're, we're, uh, my family is Northern Irish. Um, and so okay. I think, you know, for, for, part of the family lore was a lot about, you know, revolution and the idea of rebellion and religious mm -hmm. freedom and all this stuff that really is bullshit. I mean, you know, I mean, <laughs> I, I would tell, I would tell students like, you know, it was, it was wild. I remember it might've been either the first or second time I was in Ireland and I was at a pub and I'm sitting there having a pint by a priest who's also having a pint and smoking a cigarette. And saying, <laughs> you know, like yeah. it's safe uh -huh. back with the priest, you know, as long as you don't drop down the fuck or the fook, you know, you, you, that's uh -huh. fine. You can take back all you want because it's like, <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, it's like okay. what? You know, because in in our minds, you know, um, which I think we we are dealing with less of now um, because now you do have access. You you can I mean there's no substitution for actually going to a place and 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 and, and conversating with the people of that place, but you can watch a lot of video. You can see a lot of things online about a particular yeah. place. I mean, what's going on in Gaza, for instance? I don't have to go to Gaza to realize that's an atrocity. I can go there and see like, holy shit, this is bad. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I can see it just from the video. But there is a there's a it's less than an imaginary um, trip now. Um, but early on, it was totally imaginary. You know, I would read about Eamon de Valera and Michael Collins and all these great revolutionaries. And I'm like, yeah, I'm Irish. And then you get over there. And like, yeah, we, don't, we don't even talk about that shit. You know, you want another pint? <laughs> so it's just like, yeah, exactly. And, you know. Um, and, and that's, you know, for, for me, I think, you know, so much of what I thought I was, um, was just imaginary. Um, and so that's, there's a lot of that that happens here in, in the South. Um, as I, I think because of, you know, especially, you know, antebellum South and getting into the civil war, you know, it was very easy for European cultures to assimilate as long as they were white. They they would be fine now. It's and that only happens in the south. Now in the northeast, Irish were just as black as anybody else, you know. But but in the sure. south, you 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 by your color of your skin, you were not. And so um, and so I think it was a lot easier for people to just sort of mask and even um, romanticize their own traditions. Um, and then that just becomes family lore, and it just gets passed down to generation to generation. So when my dad started breaking the mold and I started breaking the mold and having to educate, you know, a lot of our family to say, yeah, we're not Scots Irish. Uh, yes, we've been in the South for a long time. Your ancestors, our ancestors did own slaves. Um, you know, these aren't things to be proud about, but, you know, these aren't things that you can can ignore either. Um, and, mm -hmm. and and that, you know, you were William Wallace, you know, in, in a country that we did were not from. Um, and, right, right. And, and you stormed the, the, you know, you stormed the bridge at Sterling or whatever. Um, you know, it's like, didn't happen that way, guys. So, so okay. well, even William Wallace didn't happen the way that, like, we no, think it of it. No, it did not. So. <laughs> yeah, the <same laughs> part is a total fiction. You know? <laughs> um, that, that's interesting because, um, so my wife uh, was born in Hong Kong. Um, she was, uh, they were living in, you know, all these countries, that America included with Mexico, Rio Grande River, and then this river border, which is not always ideal because rivers change course over time. But they were on um, the other side of the river in Vietnam. They were Chinese, but they were living on the other side and had lived there for who knows how long. I, they've, the, the family's living there. Um, 
And then when the Civil War broke out in Vietnam, they had nothing they wanted to do with Chinese, right? It was all the Chinese out of the border. And that created a bunch of refugees, um, many, 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 many of which went to Hong Kong because it was British controlled at the time. Right. And so um, my my mother-in-law and my um, father-in-law like went to Hong Kong and that's where my wife was born. Um, and and so they came to America after they got sponsored. The fam- it's very funny actually. It's part of the family gets sponsored in the UK, um, and there and there's the on my mom, her mom's side. Most of them went to the UK, and now all of the kids her age and younger have thick East London accents. <laughs> <laughs> and my my wife's father's side ended up all here in Southern California, um, and so we're all LA area. That's we're still here now, mostly because of she has so much family here. I, I'm always like, maybe we move. And she's like, my family's here. We're not moving. I'm like, let's move right. to London. You have family there too. We're, we're going. Um, but you see that assimilation um, pretty quickly, even, even with her. Um, she probably speaks English way more articulately than I do. Um, right. And she's still like, oh, like up until now, and she's been talking about now maybe going back to China. But early on, she was like, no, I don't want to go to China. I went once and it was my ex-husband and it was horrible. I never want to go back there again. Um, but then we have our son who, bringing this back, his, I'm William. My dad was William. His dad was William. Supposedly, this goes back to Ireland, hmm. that the William Hennessy's went back to there. And then when it came to, at some point in America, there's different stories. There's the Ellis Island wrote it wrong. And then there's the jilted lovers. There's whatever story. Somehow at some point it became Hensi, which is a very, is actually a fairly unique name. If you have that name, we are yeah. probably related, you know, send me a message if you're out there looking at this. Cause I bet there's some blood here. Not, not many generations back. Um, but uh, we all have different middle names. And so when we were naming him, I, I was actually okay not continuing the name, but my wife, I shouldn't say that because my dad watches the show and he'll be like, oh, you're out of the well. Um, Sorry, but uh, yeah, she was like, no, it's going to kill your dad. You have to name him William. I'm like, okay. I'm like, well, what about William Danger? And she's like, that's ridiculous. And I, I'm like, hey, but you know what? He'll be like an accountant or something. You know, everyone's always like the opposite. <laughs> Opposite of their names, it'll be fine. It's like a CPA. It's gonna be beautiful for us. Like, no, no, we're not gonna do that. I'm like, well, what about William Wallace? She's like, oh, that actually sounds kind of nice. I'm like, okay. And I start giggling. She's like, oh, god damn it, that's that blue face guy, isn't it? (laughs) (laughs) So, so when we went out and we visited, we actually. We go to before COVID. We we went like every year for a little span there because there there kept being what family weddings. Um, but we made a point the first time out there to go up to Sterling, go to the William Wallace Monument, and like see the history. I have a replica. I'll try to take a picture of it for the show. Um, I'm literally looking at it. Usually where I'm sitting, that there's a this fake dragon skull there, and there's the Wallace Monument sword that that goes between it. So it's along like the bar. Um, right. And I move it out of the way. So I have some room to record here, but um, so we got it and that that'll be his when he's, he's 12. So he's not quite, he's not quite drinking my whiskey or, you know, ready for the sword, but when, when he's ready, he'll have it. But, but there's all these mythologies, right? Like there's all of this going on and like, I, I love it actually. Yeah. Right. Like you look yeah. at it, like, but it's like, but it's like, it actually makes you realize Oh, these are stories. Like, yeah, that's all it is. Learn it's, from all of it, take it in, but then don't mythologize it in your own right. head. Like, yeah, I mean, um, I, that's that's the thing. It's 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 part of our it's it's part of our innate storytelling, you know, traditions. I mean, you know, and that's all it is: is storytelling, uh, and it's something to captivate the eyes of the uh, young and around a fire and. You know, um, you know, nobody, as long as you're not taking it to heart and and inscribing it in paper and telling folks, if that's who I am, I'm the direct descendant of William Wallace. <laughs> right. And I have uh-huh. his, um, right. you know, then, it, then it's all good. I mean, you right. know. But. Yeah. yeah, learn the lessons from the stories, not, you know, the, the story is probably more important than the fact. 
Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's like learn learn the story, the lessons from the the themes, like what you can learn from it. Let let the facts be the facts. Like if, if, that there was slavery, there was these things. Like yeah. acknowledge yeah. that. Like be self aware of all of it. Um, yeah. but don't um don't let the facts bury you either, especially when they're not related to you. Like the go ahead and like, you know, realize that there's more to learn. There's more to life. And there's, there's always continuance. Yeah. Good move. Yeah. Gotta, yeah. You know. I can't, I can't, I can't pay for the, I can't pay the price for the sins of my ancestors, but I right. can acknowledge what they did was wrong. And Absolutely. here, let me tell you a story that may or may not be true. <laughs> you know, <I> mean, <laughs> but that's but that's pretty much American history right there in and of itself. Right? So, and, so. <laughs> maybe then we can move into your writing a bit here. So um, we took a ton on probably two statements from your biography, but I thought they were interesting and, and fun to have a conversation about. Um, but I, I, I'm wondering, and I think, We've probably touched on it a bit, but it might be worth delving into very specifically. Um, I wonder where there's always there's that question: What was this story inspired by, right, or this poem inspired by? Which may or may not be interesting, depending on the story story or poem. Um, I'm wondering, maybe more specifically, where's that that kind of molten core? Like, where does the story, where does the poems, where, where do they spew up from? Like, what is, what is that core for you? Um, I, I mean, I, honestly, um, the everyday, you know, the everyday life. I mean, I think there's, there's so much that goes on in our existence that, um, you know, we're constantly worried about what's three years down the road, what's five years down the road. Um, and, you know, I feel like part of the mission of the poet is to get us to stop for a moment, you know, like, uh, you know, Whitman's insistent that, you know, there's nothing more important than what is now, what is happening right now. Um, and, you know, which for his time, that was, you know, pretty revolutionary when you had all the poets writing about Greece and Rome and, you know, all <laughs> the sure. great mythologies. And he's like, no, it's, it's right now. That's what you're missing, you know. And, um, right. and, and so for me, I think that is where a lot of it comes from. Um, you know, um, there are times when, um, you know, and, I, and I'm not saying that while something is happening, I have to just go walk away and go write about it because I can't. I have to live the moment. I have to experience it. I have to think about it. It has to give. I have to give it distance, you know, before I can actually sit down and write about it because otherwise I'm too caught up in the moment and I'm not writing about anything that is going to make sense beyond that. It's going to be completely personal. There's never going to be a universal sort of situation so um so what i what i what i typically do is you know kind of focus on the everyday sometimes even the mundane um that um uh and try to find the beauty in that um you know whether it's you know raising a uh, raising a kid right i mean on the abstraction ladder way up at the top you know it's like yeah i i made a human being live and <laughs> i'm totally responsible for it look at me um yeah. but you know i more or less want to write about the you know the awe of of the discovery of the simplest thing for the first time and that being just the most amazing thing ever and how mm -hmm. we forget that that is still an amazing thing only because right. we're 30 and 40 and 50 years removed from it. Um, or how many times we drive by something um, or walk by something and we never pause to think about it only because we've seen it every day for our entire existence. Um, and yet I don't know. I mean, I, there's a part of me that feels like if I'm not calling attention to that, if I'm not bringing that up to the forefront, um, there may be something in that that we're missing. And once we've missed it, we, we won't get it back. Um, you know, that, you know, I think we're living in an age now where we're actually seeing in our generation um, things disappear. Um, you know, beyond okay. just endangered species. And, you know, we're, we're seeing 
populations disappear. We're seeing towns and cities disappear. Um, you know, whereas in our history books, we knew that there were places that existed that no longer exist, but in our minds, we think, yeah, but it took thousands of years for that to go. We're seeing those go away within our lifetime. So if we're not stopping to to take a moment to recognize what is happening now, um, even if I'm writing about it, writing about what happened now, three weeks after it happened, that's OK. Sure. I mean, like I didn't sure. write a single poem during COVID. Um, I could. I mean, there, there was there was real things happening. You know, I mean, at the time, our oldest was. Um, uh, in college, our middle was was in the process of. Uh, I think she was a junior in high school. Our youngest was still in mil- you know in elementary school. So it felt like Little House on the Prairie. You know, my wife and I both <laughs> in college. Everybody's yeah. online. We're all here. I had shit yeah. to do. You know, I mean, like I couldn't say, wait, 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 wait. I got to write about this. Um, but yeah. you know, but in your head, it's constantly there. I mean, I think as a poet, right. you can't get away from it. So I'm mainly reminding myself, you know, remember this moment, look at this, pay attention to this, jot this note down, come back to this later, try to make sense of it or don't. Mm-hmm. Either way, you're going to create something out of it. Um, and then I think from that, there is a sense that you are preserving something um, for better or for worse. You are preserving something. Um sure may not be the thing we want to celebrate, but it can be the thing we learn from. Um, and it may be the thing that we don't think we want to celebrate, but we find out in those places um, there are things worth celebrating. Um, sure. It's kind of hard to think about that when you know there's people around you dying. But yet I felt like we grew stronger together as a family because, you know, um, everything else kind of pulled us into all these different directions, you know running this right. one out to baseball and running that one out to dance, <laughs> running this one out to school. And, you know, you're just going back and forth. You're in the day to day. You're in the mundane. Pause. Right. Look where we are. Um, and so that right. I think is the impetus of where a lot of, of my poetry is coming from. Sure. Well, I, I think that's lovely in that sense that most of life is the mundane, but it's, 99, like not, not to throw numbers out, but I'm a mathematician, so I'm going to throw out 99.57% of life is all of the mundane. So there's mundane, stupid shit we do. I mean. <laughs> right. Like, even if you're, um, if you've gone to war and things, right? Like, and if you're lucky enough to survive that war, you come back to the mundane. And part of that, a lot of times, is the hard part, right? Yeah. When people come back from war, is that the reintegrating, like, it's hard to, now come down to a level of you know, modernity that um that you can survive and then first you know you play sports right like you you peak early and you're you're off into it um and so finding the meaning in that is one of the chief questions of life right like finding the the meaning to it but you can't uh, what i always what i always tell tell writers when they when they ask me um you know speak at classes or something is and uh, I don't love the whole writer's talk yeah. block, or writer's block, I should say. I don't always love writer's talk in general. Even though I host the show, we talk, as people can see, we talk so little about writing. That's <laughs> the actual craft of writing. Yeah. Um, but I don't always like the writer's block aspect of it because I think there's there's two things. One is you didn't have writer's block during COVID. You had life, right? Like something happens to you, you lose a loved one, something, you know, there's, uh, you're, you're a victim of a crime or something. You might just have things that are more important than writing at that moment. It doesn't mean you're not a writer anymore. It doesn't mean it's not going to come. It doesn't mean you might, na- you may in fact create something really brilliant and, and inspiring and universal for everyone based on it. But it doesn't mean you're getting up at 4 a.m. and doing the 4 a.m. writers club or, or, whatever yeah. nano mama right mo or whatever it is people do those things may not happen that doesn't mean it's a block it just means that you have life going on yeah. um, and deal with that yes you have to be a person first and a writer second if you want to be a good writer if you want to be a good poet yeah. 
person, always person first. Why do anything first? <laughs> right. <laughs> be the person first. Nothing else matters. How's your writing or uh, the act of writing in general? Has it has it ever changed you in in a way that you can discern? Yeah, I mean, um, I think I think one of the things that you you have to learn. I mean, I think the difference between writing poetry and being a poet um, is is fully understanding what your writing process is. Um, for me, you know, I would hear. I mean, I would hear all these poets come in and talk about. I write every day from the hours of 5 a.m. to 7 a.m. And, you know, and I don't do anything until I've composed at least three points. I'm not like that. I don't write every day. I mean, and I do write in here. I mean, there, there's, you know, it's part of the product of living, you know, um, you know, I turned 51 this Friday and, you know, with undiagnosed and unmedicated ADHD. I mean, you know, so <laughs> I can write a lot of poems in my head while I'm doing a faculty meeting and teaching a class or having a an advising session with a student um, or changing a diaper or, you know, changing the oil. It's all the same. Right. Um, sure. But I think there are times and my wife can can certainly attest to it when i haven't been physically writing that you know that i need to i need to i need to go physically write sure. um yeah. because i am running into furniture and i'm cussing out strangers and you know in this <laughs> environment. um but but i think with 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 the most i mean with most of it 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 really is about understanding what your process is um there are times when you may go a day or two without jotting down or writing anything there may be days where you go where you're really revising you're not revi you're not writing anything there are times when like you had just said you're living you know you're 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 immersing yourself in an experience so that you can write about it um you know which that immersion takes all of your senses i mean there is no um, it's an intense, you know, way of living. Um, I had a person, an older lady one time tell me, uh, I was doing a workshop. Um, I'll tell you, working with high school kids is one thing. Working with elementary kids is freaking awesome. Um, <laughs> with senior citizens is scary as hell. Um, but, but they have great stories, <laughs> I mean, you know, no doubt <laughs> um, sure. but they are kind of, they're kind of set in their way, you know, about some things. But I had a lady one time tell me, she said, you're so lucky. I, I wish I could be a poet. And I'm like, of all the things I wish I could be a poet would be the, like, never even enter in the equation. I mean, it's not a it's not a luck thing for me. It's a curse. I mean, it literally is. It's you know, you're you're, you're called to it, and you have to feel like you're living intensely in a moment, so you can write about it. You can't help but think about everything you're around is going to be a poem. What can I, say? <laughs> what can I not say? You know, um, sure. you know, there, it's a compulsion. I mean, it literally is a compulsion. Um, sure. I think once you've wrapped your arms around that, you're okay with that. Um, and you realize that, you know, that's how you are and that's what you're going to be, then it's all good. The moment you try to resist that and you're, you know, putting your poems in, in plastic sheets and putting them in three ring binders and, you know, I've written a poem, therefore I'm a poet. Like, no, <laughs> you're not. You've written a poem and that's great. And I applaud anybody who writes a poem. But to be a poet, like I know poets in South Carolina. I mean, they devote their lives to this. They, some go into activism, some go into different aspects. They devote their lives to this shit. And then there are those who just write poetry as a hobby. You know, I know sure. people who play guitar and they're good at it, but it's just a hobby for them. I know people who play guitar and they're actually studio musicians. You know, I mean, they do it for right. a living. I mean, you know, they they mm -hmm. live it. You know, there's a big difference, right? So I think sure. uh, I think once you recognize that, that's the plus. Um, it's you know, um, so like even back when I used to do split pea soup all the time, 
I would hear people say, you know, you know, all right, you know, Ray's out there recruiting poets. I'm like, God, no, I'm not recruiting poets at all. You can't do that. Right. <laughs> you, gotta uh-huh. beat it. you know, it's not sure. church. It's not the army. You can't recruit people to do this shit. You gotta yeah. want it. Um, so, sure. um, so I think the, the, the process and understanding the process and understanding that the process is, is totally individual. It's very intimate. Um, mm-hmm. like you can have three poets on this show. And all three of us are going to have different processes and, and that's okay. Um, sure. Because it's what it, it's what it takes to get you to the point where I can walk away on a Saturday morning and know that this poem is, I, I can't take this poem any farther. If this poem wants to go off and do something else. Okay. But it's going to have to come back and tell me next Saturday. Cause I can't, I, I've, I've given <laughs> Given yeah. it what I've given it right now. Sure. Um, and it'll haunt me. If it wants to do something else, it'll haunt the shit out of me all week. Um, uh, and there's some times when I do have to stop what I'm doing um, because I can't I can't concentrate on anything else. Um, but I've gotten to a point now where I think with balancing family, balancing work, balancing all these other things that I know that I've got to give. I've got to give my art the time it deserves. So I've got to cut that time out for me to be able to do that. Um, now, thank God I'm not a fiction writer. Um, Cause if I was a fiction writer, I think I'd blow my brains out. Cause they you know that's an everyday regiment. No matter what you do, you better have your ass down in front of a computer. You better have 500 words before you leave that computer um, or your day was wasted. I, I can't, oh. I can't live like that, man. <laughs> you know, yeah, um, yeah, I, got, sure. I got friends of mine that are fiction writers and they, they, they don't live like that, but, 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 you know, there's a, there's a regiment that, that I think poetry has allowed me um, the kind of flexibility that I need to be able to raise a family and to, to work sure. a full time job. So. Yeah, no, I think that's a, um, a important distinction. I, I, I do think as a fiction writer, right. But I, so I think a couple things because you said a lot just now. I think one. <laughs> I <did it. laughs> think of how much of this bottle is left. Um, yes. <laughs> how, how am I doing over here? Um, no, I, th- I think for one is that it is, I think, just extremely important for the person to just understand what your goals are. Right? There's so if if you want to be a guitar player and you want to do that as a hobby the same as a scratch golfer as anyone else, you might get fairly good at that. Um, but keep it the hobby because maybe that's just a hobby and it, that's okay. Writing can be a hobby, poetry, fiction writing, whatever it might be. That can be a hobby that can be extremely rewarding to you as a person. Um, when you're the, the capital P poet or the capital W or A writer, author, right? Um, there is a compulsion to it that really is at times unhealthy, right? And so, um, one of the things I don't do, um, I actually always think of it as progress versus milestones. So I do like today. I probably wrote twenty five hundred words. It was actually a great day, right? I kept telling myself I need to break Good and kind of spend a little time to get ready, ready, yeah, to get ready for this show. I'm like, oh, I need to set up the bar. I need to do this. And I'm like, no, I'm in the zone. I am here. I'm, I'm not moving off this computer until I have to. <laughs> um, which was, which was great. It was the muses were speaking to me. Every, everything's, everything's flowing. It was, it was wonderful, and I just went with it. But I think. I think you have to, if you want to be a fiction writer um, and keep some sanity and have a family and keep a wife, um, which I've struggled with, but I've managed now for 13 years. <laughs> As I always look, I always look at like progress or over, over milestones. Like I don't care 500 words, 1500, whatever. Someone words. I don't care about words is yeah. maybe today I just sat and listen to the world coming to me, listen to the characters come into me. Um, and I always look at it to me, it's very much art and there's an art, there's an expression I'm trying to get out. And then how do I channel that? And maybe I wrote 20 words. Maybe I just edited, maybe whatever it might be, that was progress. So I don't care that today I happen to be writing, writing and wrote 
2,500 words versus tomorrow where I'm going to edit. I'm going to now try to make sense of that 2,500 words and, and, and the sense of everything else. So I think we're probably, oh, you know what, though, before I switch over to our, our shots portion where we're just going to do a load of shots and and the whole show is going to just be fuck all from there. Um, I did want to mention, because I did, you mentioned earlier, I forget the the name of it, but I know you've done a lot of work um, promoting writing, reading, re- you know, creative writing, especially, you know, around, um, around the area. I wonder, did you want to, beyond what you already talked about, is there anything else you wanted to say? I think one was reverse. I think that was one of the new ones. I didn't, I forget oh, to write yeah, it in my notes yeah, here. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, so. Split P was working more along with, you know, students. Um, and one of the things that we started to notice after a while were, um, uh, you know, there were teachers that wanted to pick up, you know, like, hey, how can I do this where, you know, we're, we're doing a poetry unit in April, which is good since that's National Poetry Month. Um, sure. Um, but so they would want you know sort of you know can i take what you did can i replicate that can i do this you know so so reverse really is about working with teachers on ways that you can get students to understand and appreciate poetry from a rather than a top-down approach from a bottom-up approach um you know getting a student to understand a sonnet and giving them shakespeare and giving them Shakespearean sonnets over and over and over again does not help them understand a sonnet any more than understanding what a rhyme scheme is and understanding that Shakespeare wrote them. But getting students the opportunity to write a 14-line poem um, where there's, you know, there's a narrative structure and there's a turn at the end suddenly helps them to understand sonnets. Um, and then, of course, why is that important? Um, why is any of this important? Why is art important? Why is poetry important? You know, and about, you know, what what I hear from teachers often is they can teach to the standards, they can teach to the test, but what they struggle with is teaching students how to be better humans. Um, and I'm like, and incorporate more arts into your curriculum, because that's the secret, you know. Right. Um, so reverse is really more about how to get, you know, give teachers practical lesson plans that allow them to be able to take poetry um, and to, to, to use that in their traditional language arts classrooms um, to not just get them to appreciate poetry, but to get them to appreciate the writing process in general. That process for writing poetry can be the same process for writing a five paragraph essay, a research paper, uh, a more expository piece of prose, um, you know, we would put these insane time. I would put insane time limits on students. Like, you know, I'd give them this whole thing and I'm out there, you know, setting myself on fire, getting them all excited and everything. I'm like, all right, I'm going to write a poem and I'm going to give you three minutes and 23 seconds to write it. Go. You know, and they're like, what? Okay. And, you know, and then you start writing. And that's the whole idea. It's like, look, you're not going to generate an amazing poem in three minutes and 23 seconds, but you're right. writing. You're, you're engaging in a process um, because, you know, they're, they're just thinking so much product, you know, they're, they're, there's a product. Sure. Head, so. Well, and you know what's beautiful about it? Just as you said it just now, it made me think is it's you can take that process to write essays or do these scholastic things. But then also, right, like you can take that poem prompt and what you learn from that process to compose the next text to the girl you like or the boy you like or whatever it might be. Right. Like, and then, and maybe you become a poet, but maybe that just becomes those little communications, right. The yes. email, whatever that is, email, that's going to apply to it. And I, I can see that, that being making you a better person like those teachers wanted. Yep. But then also just making you a better person for the people around you and the, the people yeah. you want to be around you. Yeah. And we're doing it with poetry. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I actually wanted to ask you about that because, you know, there was a time probably even bet- before I'm 45. So you're just a tad older. You look way younger than me, but you're tad. Thank you, Bill. Tad older. <laughs> but there was a time, right, where poetry was for the people. 
Right? Yeah. Like at some point the switch and poetry became for the hoity toity, like you know, drinking your your drink with your your pinky out folks, but it was supposed to be for the people. It makes kind of a brilliant sense because it's very short and it should be something like you don't have to spend your next. I've been spending 10 years writing this goddamn novel of pirates sailing down the Ohio River to sack a, a future Pittsburgh city, right? Like I'm like pirates of Appalachia. Like there's no pirates on the, the Ohio River. There's going to be because the world's melting down. <laughs> It can be 10 plus years, right? I can understand that maybe not being for the people because no one has time for that except for me. Poetry is meant for the people. Um, yeah. And so I, I applaud you for trying to get it to the kids and things. because, yeah. Especially when you think of how we keep shortening. Like I, I have the hardest time on Twitter because of our X, whatever we're calling it these days, yeah, whatever. Or whatever Mr. Musk is calling it these days. Because I'm like, I, I don't know how the, I, I know how to, but I don't want to try to confine this thought into some character restriction because that seems, I'm not writing, I, I'm not a haikuist. Right. <laughs> I, I can't write haikus all day. I, mean, I have different, like, different varies of thoughts. So um, I, I, I think that's uh that's beautiful that you you do you know bring it out to the teachers and the kids. Well, I don't know where the where the question is, so this might be a little open ended. <laughs> with all that with all that backdrop we just discussed, right? right. Like poetry being for the people, like getting that to the kids. Um, how do we get there to where? You know what? What are the steps to getting to a to a point back where it, you know? Now, right? It's like, I want to be a poet. And people are like, well, you want to be unemployed and, you know, or you're a professor, right? Like it's either I, you yeah. teach yeah. or I, where do you actually like, you you don't make money writing poetry books. And that's like, I'm being very broad, right? But sure. um, all caveats aside, but right, it's you generally don't and maybe never. <laughs> yeah. But where do we, where do we bridge that gap? Is there a bridging of that gap to where, be poetry becomes more for back for the masses and that art form becomes something that we all appreciate again. I mean, there, th I, I think there's one aspect of it. If you think of it as a career, um, you know, I mean, yeah, if you think of it as a career, the, 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 the statistics do not align very well for you. I mean, um, now, I'm saying that in the sense that, you know, in the state of South Carolina, um, we had a period um, not that long ago where uh, within about a five year span, three of the National Book Award winners in poetry were all South Carolina poets. Um, oh, wow. You know, um, one of which has gone on to win, you know, MacArthur Fellowships and winning awards. I mean, Terrence Hayes he's okay you know he'll be okay um, <laughs> sure. so, I mean as a South Carolinian I do and I love Terrence and Terrence did blurb my um, uh, my my I don't want to say my latest book because that comes out in March but but the but punch you know he did write a blurb for it um, I'm not going to email Terrence and ask him for money um, but he's doing okay all right. So, um, sure. Nikki Penny, who is here in South Carolina, she is doing just fine. Justin mm -hmm. is doing good. I um, mean, you know, so there are ways in which one can be a poet and have a career and and make a, a, a living that is, you know, kind of mind blowing, honestly. Um, sure. But the thing that I impart to students uh, that, that want to be it, you know that 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 want to be a poet um it's a calling um it's like a teacher you know if i if i have a student and i'm advising and a student's like i say well you know what do you want to do you know what do you want to what do you want to major in what do you want to be and like i don't know i was thinking of this maybe i'll go into teaching like yeah maybe you should you know if that's your last resort 
then no, you oh. should not. Teaching is not a fallback position. <laughs> Being sure, a poet sure. is not a fallback position, right? Like, I can't do anything. I guess I'll be a poet. Um, so, you know, it's, it's one of those things where, where it's like, look, you know, the, the, the upshot, what your, what your goal is, is to write poetry and you're willing to devote your life to writing poetry and you're willing to go through all of the knocks. And there are a lot of knocks. I mean, I've been published a lot and every publication, I guarantee you every single poem I've had published has had at least a dozen or more rejections before it was published. If you're willing to go through that, I mean, we're talking, the stakes are really low, man. I mean, and right. the heartbreak is immense. If you're willing to do that, then fuck it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what, <laughs> what the right. upshot is. You're willing to do that, do it. Go with it. The biggest thing, I think, for, for teachers and for students and what, what I have been able to sell sort of the program on hasn't really been anything at all to do with poetry. Um, it's been about their aspects and what they plan to do in whatever careers they want to go into. Um, the, the, the day is going to come when they're going to get an interview. And when they have the interview, there's always going to be the question, tell me something about yourself. And if you sit there and you hem and haw and mm, I don't know, I guess I like music and hanging out with my friends, <laughs> you know, you're not going to make much of an impression. But when you're able to go and, and and talk about the things that you like because you've been writing about that, you know these things, um, they're a part of you, man, they're going to eat that up. They're going to listen to you and like, holy shit, nobody's ever answered the question like that. I mean, I expected you to want to poke dead things with a stick, but I didn't know you wanted to take those things and put them in your pocket and make them a party. <laughs> wow. you know? right. So, so you, you were going to stuff them, put them on the mantle and, you know, right. give them a name, I mean, backstory. You know, like, it I mean, it's, it, it's, a, it's, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, for, for, for lack of a better, better way of describing it, you know, so much of life and so much of life in America is, you know, check the boxes, fit the box, um, uh, fit the part, um, and hope for the best. When you stand out from that, people pay attention. So, you know, yeah, I mean, if, if I worked with a thousand students and one dedicated themselves to be a poet i think that's that's the that's a, a statistic i can live with you know sure. i think that's that's possible the other 999 of them are going to at least walk through the life with 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 a confidence and knowing that they can articulate what they see in the world um their feelings are valid um and they can empathize with those around them um, and I think that if they're going out in the world and they're going out into a job force with that kind of mentality, no matter what they major in in college, no matter what their career is going to be, they are going to accomplish amazing things. Um, and they're going to better the, the, the world around them. Um, and, and if there's an ulterior motive, that bodes well for me. Um, because those little assholes got to take care of me, you know. So if they're thinking along these lines, I'm okay. Um, but but Very you know, but in all in all seriousness, it it really is. It's not so much about them devoting towards the art form or being a poet, it, and as much as it is about them realizing um, how much they have to contribute to the community that they are part of and how much their community that they're a part of can contribute back to them. Um, and I think, I think poetry, like all art, I mean, whether they, they want to go off and be musicians or painters or sculptors or dancers or go off and go into theater, whatever those things are, um, you know, the arts establishes that and gives them a connection to that so so poetry is at the end all be all but but it's definitely a way in um and sure. for some of my you know some of my more quiet introverted students that becomes a way for them to really come out um you know you can tell the, sure. the 
find their voice kind of yeah. in that way. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. You can tell the theater kids. You know when they're in the classroom. <laughs> you know? um, the musician kids are like caged animals, you know, and the, right. the artists are a lot like the creative writers, you know, like don't right. get sure. sharp object because I could stab you with it, you know. Back <laughs> But but they are, um, you know, by and large, whether I've worked with elementary, middle school, high school, uh, even even uh, older adults, um, you know, that's that's the commonality. Um, it's 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 just art, man. I mean, that's all it is. Um, and mm-hmm. Poetry is is just like that. When I when I ask students if they like poetry and they'll all tell me, no, man, I don't like that shit at all. Uh, and I read some poems to them like, OK, I like that. You know, I like that kind of poetry. And so I right. explained to them, like, would you would you say you don't like music? They're like, no, no, I like music. I like certain kinds of music. I'm like, yeah, see, that's art and that's poetry. You know, there's certain mm-hmm. kinds of poetry I don't like. I mean, I don't like the stuff that's cerebral and esoteric. I mean, I don't, I, I, I'm haunted enough by poetry. I don't need to be sitting there thinking like, oh, <laughs> right. Um, you know, there's some music I don't like, you know, there's sure. some theater I don't like, you know, that's okay. But you can't just say, I don't like theater. I don't like art. I don't like, you know. Right. Poetry, yeah. you know? Well, that usually means you haven't um, exposed yourself to it too much. Right. Exactly. Like, so I don't exactly. like poetry. You just yeah. haven't exposed yourself to the poetry you would end up liking because right. it, it is like music and theater and everything else. There's some you're going to end up liking. Yeah, Put I didn't like cauliflower there. until somebody prepared it and were like, holy shit, that's cauliflower? <laughs> and that's about all I can say about cauliflower. <laughs> very good, very good. So cauliflower aside, I think we're well overdue for some shots. Okay. So if you'll uh, humor me here and take a shot every time I ask you a question, uh, we have some rapid fire questions here. Um, there's no right answers unless it's the disparaging the show. That's always a wrong answer. <laughs> so if you're ready, we'll get started. All right. All right. Here we go. Yeats or Shakespeare? Who you got? Oh, Yeats, always. Oh, oh I'm with you. I'm with you. I, I like the bard, but I think at times maybe a bit overrated. Yeats was had some pretty... Pretty magical. And I'm not always the the poetry buff, but Yeats has some magical phrases that you, you got to give it to him. Um, question two. Have you ever witnessed anything inexplicable? Yes. Short answer. <laughs> well, well, we can't have that's too short of an answer. What's the inexplicable nature? It'll be in a poem one day, Bill. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> 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 all right you better send me that poem because that's my you favorite it. question no, now. every anyone watching the show will realize i ask that one every time because i really like enthused i'm like i want to hear about the ufo or the bigfoot like what's happening you know so yeah, or the no, ghost, there, there, whatever there are be. some things there's some things i'm still wrestling with yes um and i will say i will say i'll give you a hint it definitely has to deal with hauntings um but you know when you live in the south this whole fucking place is haunted <laughs> just so you know <laughs> <laughs> very good very good um all right so next one favorite podcast and why is it this one <laughs> i do like this podcast <laughs> um we have a podcast here um well sorry this is tough man um all right so there's the podcast that i host um at uh the columbia museum of art as a writer in residence i have to i have to say it's one of my favorites um i i love drew Barron. he does a lot uh, he's the producer you know how it is i mean what you're doing what, is what's impressive. the name though what's the name um, I didn't, it's called didn't binder um okay. the binder podcast um okay, and very good so what you're doing is pretty amazing, Bill, because you're 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 hosting it, you're doing the whole thing, you edit it, you do all that. With the binder podcast, I, I have it made, man. I host it, <laughs> I get to ask all the questions. Drew has to produce everything and make it sound like it's a genius. Um, there, you go. there is a there is one though that I've been listening to, and it's actually been housed out of the University of South Carolina. Um, it's called Talk of the South, um, or Take On No, it's Take on the South. 
Um, and, and it's really, really cool. Um, it gives you a really cool aspect of, of Southern culture that we don't normally think about, whether it's food or bourbon or wrestling, um, you know, <laughs> brass, um, yeah. you know, stuff like that. Um, so that's pretty cool. There was another podcast that I was listening to for a while and I can't remember the damn name of it, but I'll just give you a, a, a skinny. It's, um, it's two actors and they basically pretend that they've received pilot podcasts from, you know, listeners but it's them and they're acting out the pilot podcast and they are absolutely bizarre and hilarious. Um, I have an hour and 15 minute commute, you know, one way. And so I, I do, I do dig on some podcasts. Very good. Very good. Send me the links for those. I'll, I'll include them on the I will. show. I will. Yeah, I'll definitely. Um, I'm all about spreading the love as long yeah, as yeah, part yeah, of yeah. the love well, is for me. You have you know, to, man. Yeah, we have to. <laughs> well, and it's funny because before COVID, it was all video, 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 video. And, yeah. and and there's still some 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 need for that. But podcasts have become such a big thing because you yeah. know yeah. I can well, walk. And they and said it. radio was dead, right? No, no, yeah. no. Radio just became podcasts. That's all be right. exactly. I mean, you know, yeah. get with the podcast, man. <laughs> right, right, right. I I think 50 plus percent of the audience of the show, like it's it's video. They'll be out there. You can see our our beautiful faces out there for them. But most of the people listen to it and work out, commute, whatever it might be. So when I used to commute, yeah, I I loved anything like that. So um, getting back, so what is one place everyone should visit? One place everyone should visit um, here in South Carolina. Um, oh my God, I'm gonna get in so much trouble. Um, for <laughs> um, I would say you have to visit Charleston. You have to visit Charleston, South Carolina. Um, it has everything. I mean, you know, as a rich history, a history that predates the Civil War. That's important in here in South Carolina. Um, so, but there is, it, it's so multicultural and, and so rich. I mean, you know, you feel the ghosts of the past, um, but you also feel the, 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 progress of the future um, sure. close second or or if that's one a one b would be greenville south carolina um okay um you know kind of upstate area but but definitely charleston okay very good um sheep devil in disguise or excellent for counting mm, delicious <laughs> Is that a category? <laughs> um, well, I was like, this is fine. I try to I try to teach my students not to be sheep. Um, yeah, um, I don't think they're devils in disguise at all. I think they're they're yeah they're excellent for counting. They're finally <laughs> they're, they're they're usually in the poll numbers you hear on the on the on the news. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> the exit polling is that the yeah, so like, oh, that's what the sheep polling, are talking yeah. about. Yeah, yeah. Who would even answer those questions? I mean, so. <laughs> I know, really. I know of all the time I've voted, I've never been part of an exit poll. I'm never like, been asked, never <laughs> <laughs> before or after. So. Right. Right, I know it'd be nice to be asked. You know, like yeah. exit pollers, where are you? I, I think I could be a difference. <laughs> <laughs> um and last one here for our shots what's the best worst excuse a student has ever given you the best excuse um was uh was a student that was supposed to come in for an exam and i tell my students all the time look if you can't make it to class if, if you've got to be out just tell me you're sick this student not only told me they were sick, but went into excruciating detail about how they had diarrhea. And the event happened in the car, <laughs> like on the way to class. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, you're good. <laughs> yes. Just email me when you feel better. We'll reschedule the exam. Um, <laughs> 
worst excuse was I, I, um, I, I'm sorry. This was like three weeks. Man, no, this was four weeks into the semester. Um, and a student was on my roll, but hadn't been in class and apologized for not being in class, but they had a broken toe. <laughs> so I was like, okay, <laughs> I've had a lot of broken toes, you know, um, yeah. What the fuck? I mean, I had people in this class because of, you know, a loved one died, a relative died, right. diarrhea at all in their car, whatever, but broken toe. I mean, come on, you know. Um, so, so yeah. There you go. I don't know That's which funny. one was best and which one was worse in that bill, but there you go. Very good. They both work. You, you know what it reminds me of? The uh, I worked at the uh, call center. It was actually where I met my wife. Um, and I, I met a dear friend of mine, Fufi, you know, shout out. I think he listens to the show sometimes. Um, and, uh, and Fufu calls, you know, the helpline to call out sick and he gets me right. And we're best buddies. It was okay. I, I can't make it in today. Can you tell the supervisors? I'm like, of course. What do you want me to tell them? You decide. Of course. And so I sent an email to all the supervisors. Fufu will not be in today because he has explosive diarrhea. <laughs> He's like, why did you say that? You left me, you left me up to my own devices. And yeah, this was the excuse. You know? <laughs> yeah, my pe- the people that know me know better. They will never say that to me, ever. <laughs> uh, come God on. bless him. He should have known better. Like he this, this was not better, a surprise. <laughs> So then maybe then we can transition. Um, if you have um, a piece of your work, you could read us. That would be lovely. I, would I mean, if it's best. short, it could be multiple pieces if you'd like. I will do my best to read it now um, after. Um, <laughs> That's the of skill time. of it. I like to see right, how skilled yes. the readers are. Like, get you liquor it up and then see how it goes. Right. Listen up, kids. This is how you know you're a real poet. <laughs> Um, yeah, if you're if you're OK with it, I will read. Um, you cool if I read um, two or three poems from the new book? No, that would be great. Yeah. As much right. as you would like. Take your time. All right. So um, uh, this is a poem called um, these are poems that are coming out of um, the last Saturday in America. Um, it's a book of poetry that's coming out on. Um, well, it says here on the advanced reading copy, uh, March 12th, 19, uh, I mean, uh, 2024, not 1924, <laughs> uh, but uh, 2024. Um, this is published from uh, Hub City Press. They published uh, Punch, um, my my collection before this one. And uh, they're just such an amazing press. And, and I love them all, their energy. I mean, there's something about an indie press. I mean um and they are uh they they fit the bill and there's no two ways about that i won't talk too much about them i don't want to get emotional before i read a poem so here we go uh this is a poem called um where bullies come from because you know younger guys who'd hogtie a boy and not think anything about leaving him in a field stripped down to the bin gay and his jock strap go ahead and say it could be worse because it isn't you because you say we're not born to hate that there is no such thing as evil birth go ahead and believe that too Not because boys will be boys alone to the dark, careful not to shift too hard or careful not to cut eyes the wrong way with nothing but faith, just a birth to a world that is exposed and thirsty. The look we make when we're helpless because you believe that it's necessary that we are all born to stay born. Because you say that it's worse to live with the fact that there are countless ways to not set foot in a patch of yard that didn't want you there in the first place. To do everything you could do to not end up there in the first place. To do something, anything, that didn't involve the binding of another human in the first place. 
you are saying nothing. Look past the obvious. Think about what I am not saying. Maybe one day you'll grow up. Maybe one day it will be the worst thing you've done. I don't even know. I'll have to watch that on the recording because, man, I'll tell you the truth. I kind of blacked out a little bit on reading that. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> no, it was really powerful. Um, you want to read a couple more? That'd be fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to read a Don't couple you? more. Um, so, so a lot of this book is is looking a lot at masculinity and kind of the origins of them. And so, this idea that you know this last poem, um, where bullies come from, this idea that you know, we'll, you know, this boys will be boys kind of thing. Um, and so, um, and this is a poem that kind of builds off of that um, called um, "Black and White Cowboys." After cartoons, it's black and white. Someone has to die and someone else has to stand there and watch it, but it's never enough to stop the commercials. What's the point of complicating cruelty when there's money to be made? The boys judge what's good or bad by the only colors they've given. There's a white man in a white hat. He beats the dust off his thighs, reaches down with his index finger towards the trigger and takes the ground from under the other man's feet. Color makes no difference to the dead, but the boys see good guys and bad guys marked by contrast and brightness. They confuse it with what's left standing and what's left to bleed as scripted, as directed, as advertised. Soon they will yell and squeal and cheer, ready to reenact what they saw, ready to turn on each other by the closing credits. And we will be relieved if they just do it outside where we can see them. Which is a little bit of a true story. Um, you know, um, I mean, I think your generation, Bill, and, and mine, I think we, you, did you have Saturday morning cartoons growing up? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, what's funny is as you, as you were reading that, I really started to wonder, I was like, I wonder what this next generation, like what the, the touch points are. Like, I wonder yeah. if it, it literally might be memes. Yeah. Right? Like my be. son it, loves it, to show me, yeah. like, show me yeah. memes. And I don't I like, you know, I'll be driving. I'm like, dude, I can't, I can't, I'm trying to not crash us into the curb here. But um, I wonder if that's what it is, because, yeah, it used to be like you had cartoons. Like as you come home from school, you had G.I. Joe and Transformers, you Saturday morning cartoons and yep. uh, you hit the spaghetti westerns and things. So, yeah, yeah always no, it, it after 12. Right. So, mm -hmm. yeah, um, I was talking to a buddy of mine. It's like we always knew when Saturday morning. When Saturday mornings were over, when Soul Train came on. <laughs> Soul Train, you know, oh, that's it? right. Yeah. It was Soul Train. And there was yeah. wrestling, and then there was the spaghetti westerns, you know. I mean, so yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, um, so I'm gonna read this this uh this next poem is um uh and I hope these are translating okay. Um I think they sound bright. Yeah, yeah. I haven't read a lot of I haven't drank a lot of Knob Creek, but um this is all right. Um, <laughs> that's my endorsement. It's all right. Um, That'll so, be their so, new commercial after this. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Drink about five of these and try to read some poems. Uh, so, 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 so this book, um, this book is really diving into the idea of masculinity. And now, granted, it is looking through the lens of Southern masculinity um, just because that's, that's where I grew up. That's how, that's what I know. Um, but a lot had changed. I think, you know, when I was writing the book, I, I originally was thinking a lot about men um, and, you know, why we do some of the things we do. Um, and when COVID came, 
Um, it was, I don't know. It, I think there was, a, there was that, it, that moment when I realized that the way I can make this, this book end is it needs love. Um, so I'm going to read a, I'm going to read a love poem in the way that only Ray McManus could write a love poem. Okay. I'm sorry. I heard a loud noise outside and thought I had fireworks, but it's just a kid on a skateboard. <laughs> Very good. Weird. Cause it's, it's like nine twenty eight here in South Carolina. Um, so here's a poem called, <clears throat> How the West is One, um, and I wrote this poem after reading, um, I can't remember the title of his poem, but it was a poem by Matthew Olsman, and um, it was a workshop that uh, Nicole Brown and her then wife, um, Jessica Jacobs, were doing this workshop, and I brought them in to the museum to do it, and, and, and I don't know, um, it all just sort of came together, so. How the West is one. Because you show no mercy for a small killing, just drop chicken on our plates and watch us eat. Because when the kids sleep, you crouch in the darkest corner of our bedroom where the smells of their feet can't distract you from watching the movement of their bellies. Because you take a stand at the kitchen window when I want to piss in the sink. Because you see a faint punch of light against a cold night and joke that you know the kind of man who would, who would sit around a fire and let you pull the graveyard taste from their mouths. That is a joke, right? Because when I said we should move to Akron, you didn't budge. When I said we should move to Dallas, you didn't budge. And when I said we should move to Sligo, you didn't budge because you don't budge for my bullshit. Like the time you placed your hand on my chest to stop me from beating a man to death who almost ran over our entire family in the public's parking lot. Because later you whispered in my ears that it turns you on when I bag our groceries myself. Because you know I like it when you lie. Like when, my kids, when our kids leave for school and we get to break our savage hearts against each other. And 15 minutes later, you rework the notches on your belt and adjust your holster for a showdown in the board boardroom at high noon. Because you tell me you appreciate me taking the time. Because I know you're not the type to wait for a man to slow walk his paces because you'll shoot first from the hip if necessary. And when it's November, it stays November and you will put food on the table any way you can kill it. Because there was that time two summers ago when you could have died or the eight years before that when doctors couldn't stop the bleeding and you should have died. And your only real worry was that no one was eating? Because you put the meat in our stomachs, not God. And before we eat anything, we hold our hands for grace. You rub your thumb over the top of my busted knuckle. That is a Ray McManus love poem, everyone. <laughs> Drunk and I shit. loved every moment of it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Appreciate it. I'll have to watch the recording because I won't remember any of this. <laughs> Very good. I, I watch the recording. You will. <laughs> but I like to say on this show, and everyone's going to get tired of me saying it, the five people that listen routinely, it's last call. Your dad being one of them. <laughs> My dad. That's the only fan, family member. Four other people not related to me. God bless you. It's last call. You don't have to go, but you will have to restart the video. Um, the last thing I do like to ask everybody is, if you could impart some piece of advice on anyone watching today, the five people we just acknowledged on, on here, um, 
it's just some small thing that would make their life just a little bit better. Uh, not sure. writing related, just people related. What would that be? Um, yeah. So read, 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 read everything, you know? Um, and I don't mean the, the, the news articles that pop up on Apple news, but, but go deep down into it, you know, read the articles about obscure places, obscure things, get to know the world around you. I mean, there's a vast, vast world. There's so much shit in it and right. we've only scuffed the surface, right? The other part of that is live. I mean, you go out to a restaurant, it'd be the same restaurant you've always gone to. Enjoy every bite. Enjoy every swallow. Enjoy everything you're doing. Enjoy the moments. Because the moment's going to come when there are no moments. It's done. You know? Um, and then the last final piece is for the love of God and whatever other entity you worship. Always remember your place in humanity. You are a human being amongst millions of human beings. We do stupid shit. We do amazing shit. We do so many things in any given day. <laughs> Take the moment, acknowledge, be proud, be proud that you are among us. <laughs> yeah. Live and live, live. Yeah. Absolutely. Awesome. That's lovely. And thank you for that. And thank you, Abelia, for coming on. This has been great. I always, I always say, and I, I mean this very genuinely. I always feel better for these conversations. I know like I've been drinking, so maybe I just like there's that euphoria, but I think about them often after, and I'm yeah. sure I will continue to think about this and, and our time. So this has been a, a real thrill for me. Thank you so much for coming on here. Um, and, uh, and we'll continue to be in touch and I'll support you in, in whatever possible ways I can. And when I'm out in South Carolina, because there's so much guests I've had in South Carolina, I have a road tour, so I will be stopping. You definitely, you definitely have to let us know when you come to South Carolina. I'll take you down to Dan. I think you had Dan Turner on your show. I had uh, Dan, yeah, back. right. Yeah, Dan's yeah. a sweetheart, love him to death. Um, you know, uh, yeah you're not going to find um you know unfriendly faces here um you know we're happy as hell to, 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 you know that we i think there's kind of a saying here in south carolina we really don't know a stranger um but we don't trust yankees so you know coming <laughs> from the west coast you're okay <laughs> you just tell people you're from there if you tell people you're from pennsylvania or west virginia or wherever you know, we, we're gonna we're gonna judge you a little bit. The question: West Virginia? It's, it's I mean, it's on the fence. Yeah, West, right? Virginia, West Virginia's okay. Kentucky, that's a little different. Um, so <laughs> no, you're, you'll be okay either way. But, um, dude, man, this was a blast. Um, you know, anytime you know, um, and just for our listeners, I don't know you. I've never met you before, and yet in 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 this short amount of time, we've been able to talk together. Um, I feel like I've known you my whole life, you know, and so I feel like we, you know, we could, we could have carried this conversation on for hours. Um, on end sure, end sure, sure. You have to edit it, um, and eventually <laughs> you have to go to bed. I think, um, yeah. but uh, you know, uh, it was just an honor and a privilege to to be able to to talk about poetry and where I grew up and and my work, and just thank you so much for for having me on and. Um, uh, and this is a really cool show. I've, I've caught a couple of episodes and and they're they're funny as hell um, because you can tell from the more, you know, from the early on, it's like, OK. And then once the alcohol starts kicking in, it's, <laughs> it's kind of wide open. You know, <laughs> so, it's a lot of fun, man. So thank you so yeah. much for having me on, brother. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on, Ray. And then uh, if anyone does, and I'll include it on the links here, but what's the best place if anyone wants to learn more and find the, you know, your latest books, et cetera. Sure. Um, the easiest way to reach me is on my website, www.raymcmanuspoetry.com. Um, there's even a page on there where you can email me directly. Um and uh, but you can certainly find not only my books, but where you can order them. 
um, and that sort of thing. The last two are certainly from Hub City Press, and so that makes it a lot easier. Uh, Red Dirt Jesus is getting a little harder to find, um, uh, so I'm hoping that there'll be a reissue in the not so distant future. Um, but um, sure. but yeah, that's probably the easiest place. Awesome, awesome. Well, thanks again so much, Ray. This was a, this was a real pleasure. I I enjoyed the hell out of it and getting the, ch- the chance to uh, to meet you and you know virtually. You know, I bagged my virtual, but I have a fantastic time with all of these because we would not be able to do this with me being in California and you being on the other coast here. Sure. Um, yeah, outside of the blue moon where, I, where I'm out that way, you're out this way. So this, this has right. been a blast. So thanks so yeah, much yeah. for coming on. Uh, my pleasure, man. Yeah. You let me know next time you come to South Carolina or when you come to South Carolina. Um, <laughs> I will. Speed to do, man. We'll keep you yeah. safe. 